Kentucky Senator uh, Rand Paul is with us. How are you? Good, Sean. Good to be with you. Well, what's, you, you, you. The next time you see your father, what's up with his attack against me and Rush and Levin and Fox News? What was that all about? You know, I must have missed that. I've, I have been out of touch. What was it? Well, he's attacking us as saying we're more, I don't, I don't even know what he was saying. I mean, it was just more to the, the impact that we're big spending liberals. I'm like, you're out of your mind. Well, I said, particularly you, on, on the heels of your 15th anniversary, I'll have to talk to him about that. Yeah, I think you got to talk to him about it and, you know, tell him, uh, hey, uh, Dad, in case you haven't noticed, Hannity and I both support the Mac Penny plan. And Hannity supports uh, supports you on your comments on the Fed. And Hannity says you've been right on a lot of economic issues and spending issues. Hannity just disagrees with him on foreign policy issues. Uh, and and you know we're going to have to bring him on the program. And every time I invite him, he chickens out and bails out. Well, I think he's been on there a couple times, but I think the really we ought to try to emphasize more the areas we agree because I think we uh, agree on a lot of areas, and uh, even you and my father agree on on probably eighty to ninety percent of what's going on that it needs to be constitutional, that we need to have limited government and balanced budget. Yep, I so agree with a lot all that. that. You guys agree with? I, that's why I'm looking at this and I'm saying, you know, I've told him a hundred times, and, it, and apparently he only wants to hear what he wants to hear. That's all right. I'll take it out on. I'll take it out with him next time I see him. But he won't come on the program. He's been ducking and dodging me every single time I book him. And then his his supporters complain I don't put him on. I'm like, well, I can't win. <laughs> you can't win. I will talk to him about getting you on your program because I think it's a great way to talk to conservatives around the country. Absolutely. All right. Well, first of all, you are gonna you're making this address about government regulatory overreach. Uh, you made the you made the address a couple of days ago, and I wanted to ask you about it because, you know, besides cutting spending. You know, if we want to, if we want to initiate a lot of business in this country, we've got to get the government off our back. Well, yeah. What we're doing is we're actually having a hearing on Capitol Hill, and we're bringing people to Washington who have been abused by government regulations. We have the CEO of Gibson Guitar is going to be appearing and talking about the government coming in and raiding his business. And get this, they're saying that he's violated a foreign law, a law in India, and that somehow he can be responsible for violating somebody else's law. And it, this is really a sad state of affairs. Gibson Guitars employs 2,600 people, and our government is going down and harassing them and showing up on their premises with armed agents. And it really is a travesty. Well, that, it is unbelievable what they've done in the Gibson Guitar case. I mean, 26 armed agents going into a guitar company uh, because – and by the way, they had all the proper documentation, as I understand it, correct? Yes, and the, the other thing we're going to bring out is that there is something that Congress passed called the Lacey Act, which says that U.S. companies, American companies, have to obey foreign laws or they can be prosecuted criminally and civilly. We're going to talk about this in the hearing, and we are going to propose some legislation uh, to try to get rid of the Lacey Act. Well, it makes sense to me, and uh, Gibson Guitars, as I understand it, are made in the U.S., and they've created jobs uh, over all these many years. Well, that was one of the real awful things about this is that the government, the administration, sent them a letter and said, if you'll finish the guitars in India, you won't be in violation of the law. <laughs> so it really had nothing to do with the wood being imported. They just said the wood needed to be finished. India obviously wants it done there, so the work gets done in India. And so it's just a labor protection law for India. Why, would, why should we be concerned about jobs in India, not jobs in America? How much do you think politics played a part in this? Because the CEO of Gibson, who I interviewed, a great guy, uh, apparently has been an outspoken conservative, and there are many other guitar companies that were doing the same exact thing as Gibson. Well, I would hate to think that we have selective prosecution, but, you know, that's sort of the definition of arbitrary government. And I think it's somewhat arbitrary whether it was political or not in the sense that these laws are not being written in a constitutional way. These laws are being written by regulators and bureaucrats who are not elected. And I think we need to get back to where laws are written by Congress and passed by both houses and signed by the president. We now have thousands of pages of laws passed every year, we call them regulations, that have no oversight and no congressional debate. What do you think could happen? For example, I think the number one regulatory change that we need to make where we get the most bang for our buck is allowing offshore drilling and, and gas exploration and coal mining and, and building nuclear power plants. you agree with that? Yes, and in fact, we are uh, introducing a Republican jobs plan this week that I've been helping with, and that'll probably be introduced either Wednesday or Thursday of this week. And one of the big things in there is 
we uh, want to help uh, energy production in our country, and we estimate that as much as a million jobs could be created in the energy sector if we would allow people to drill for oil, mine coal, build nuclear power plants. We need to free up our energy industry, but there'd be a lot of jobs created, and the bonus would be we wouldn't be so dependent on Middle Eastern oil. Have you been following these uh, Occupy Wall Street protests? Yeah, and I have a, it just sort of gives me a bad feeling, and I, I guess I, I have likened it to the Paris mob because I see no clear-cut political protest except for the fact that they don't like people who have been successful. And I think the president's been stoking the flames on this. I've heard his political speeches. He says the rich people have too much money. You should go get some of their money. He's willing to do it as an intermediary for you with the force of government. But what I fear is that as these mobs get riled up, they're going to skip the step of waiting for government to get their goodies from people who have more than they do. They may just go directly to the store, throw a brick through, and take what they think they what, what, what they think they deserve. You know, I've been trying to have conversations with the people down there, and it's nearly impossible. Their message is utterly incoherent, and they all they keep talking about is the 99% versus the 1%. And I try to explain, okay, well, the 1% pays 40% of the tax bill. 10% pays 75% of the bill. The bottom 50% pays nothing. I mean, tell me what you think is fair, and then they get angry at me. Well, it's all predicated on a lie, and see, the president has been foisting this lie upon the public, and that's that the rich don't pay taxes. And in reality, we have a very progressive income tax, and the average millionaire, 99% of millionaires pay about 29% in income tax. The average carpenter pays about 15 or 16%. Yep. So when he goes around the country saying that a carpenter is paying a higher rate than a, than a uh, millionaire, it is just absolutely false, and we cannot let him do this and uh, basically – uh, bend and manipulate facts into something that isn't true. Well, what's frustrating is you're you're 100 percent right. I mean that the middle class is paying about that 15 percent range. Uh, the the upper income people are play, paying close to the 25 percent range. And we're, we're not even including in those figures in states that have state income tax and sales tax and property tax and and hidden taxes. And then if you die, the death tax and everything else is in between. So. You know, the rate, for example, if you live in New York, you, you pay about 55 cents of every dollar. Yeah, if you look at the uh, effective tax rates as you go up the income ladder, between about uh, 50000 and 75000 you pay between 14 and 17% of your income. If you make over 500000 uh, you pay over 29%. So it just isn't true what he's saying, but it's all based on envy. It's based on emotions. And when you have emotionalism as your argument, I fear that the ultimate conclusion is, why wait for the government to take it from the rich? Why don't you just go directly to their door or to their store and get it yourself? If they've gotten it, you know, if it's ill-gotten gains mm -hmm. and we deserve it, why don't we just go take it? And that sort of mob mentality, and by preaching this class warfare, it's what I fear that uh, will come out of this. You know, I've been watching this whole presidential nomination process, and, and I decided early on that I'm not going to endorse anybody in, until later, and I just want to I want to see the process unfold, and I want to see where the candidates stand, and I want to see how strong they get when they meet adversity and controversy, et cetera. And, and I think that uh, the process is healthy because I think in the end it's going to be T-ball compared to the main event, which is going up against President Obama, especially his billion dollars. Um, it's frustrated me that, that there are so many within the Republican ranks that keep looking outside the current field of candidates. Like, for example, they were looking for Chris Christie or Governor Palin, and I think if either one of them wanted to get in, that's fine. But I don't like the idea of begging people to get in a race if they don't feel compelled to do it within themselves. Yeah, I think it's a syndrome of the grass is always greener. And the thing is, is once someone jumps in and then everyone examines their record, they find out, well, gosh, he's not the perfect conservative either. And so I think all the candidates have an Achilles heel. And part of what the primary is is to sort that out and see if you get stronger as you, you go through the vicissitudes of the debates. And they're not easy. I've been through it myself. I went through a tough primary. Yep. But it does make you better. And I think they all have gotten stronger on the stage and stronger at uh, presenting their messages. So uh, well, I, I think thought one of the – it's funny you say that because I remember when the, when the mainstream media started going after you and the national media was attacking you, you, you said, you know what, I'm going to talk to the people of Kentucky because they're the ones that are going to elect me. That was brilliant. And I, I remember thinking, all right, he knows what he's doing. 
It did make a difference, and the thing is, is everywhere I, I go around Kentucky, I still hear the same thing. People are they they come up to me and they say, "Stay the course." They, they don't say, stay. "I heard you on the Sean Hannity show the other day." <laughs> they may have, and uh, but yeah, I mean, people around Kentucky and people I meet everywhere I go are they want us to stand on principle, Absolutely. they want us to stand for what's right, and they want us to balance the budget. They don't want us just to say, "Well, maybe we'll do it in thirty or forty years from now." Now that the field is set, whoever wins the nomination will. You support them? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, we always love having you on, and uh, I'm I'm kidding you about your dad, but I mean, I was like, gee whiz, does he, does he even listen to me? Because he's saying things that are just not true. Yeah, my guess is he will be on. I didn't see his comments, so it's hard for me to comment on him because I, I haven't yeah. seen the comments. But uh, I'm I'm guessing he'll come back on, and I'd love to see him get on there because I think there's really a lot of his message that really is about the constitutionality. Listen, of how I we agree go with you, war, Dad, on economic on. issues. I agree with him on on the Federal Reserve. I agree with him on balanced budgets. I agree with him on Obamacare. You know, the only area of disagreement we have is on issues of foreign policy and getting uh, bin Laden and this other guy we got recently. And right. I just, I just, I think and some it's of that's the, the positions that are more difficult. But I think on some of it, for example, a bigger issue than any of those uh, individual issues would be when we go to war, should we declare war like the Constitution said, and should Congress vote on it? I think that you would probably be right there yeah, with us uh, on that but, issue. But I think, for example, President Bush did that with the authorization of the use of force. The Constitution doesn't say you have to use use these specific words if if Congress authorizes force, well, that's war. Well, definitely in comparison to Libya, you're right, because no. in, in, with regards to Libya, not only did we not have any votes, when we finally did have votes, Congress voted not to authorize Absolutely. going to war in exactly. Libya. So really, the, the current president, uh, for all of their complaints about Bush, this has been really a lawless presidency, which has taken you're us to war right. with no vote. And, and the th look, I've never been a big fan of the War Powers Act. But it is the law of the land, and the president totally ignored it. Yeah, and I think there's a great danger to that. And their their argument is, well, this was a small war. But at the same time, small wars can become big wars, and this could be a precedent for another war that's fought without any congressional authority. So I think you're right. There was a big difference between Iraq and Afghanistan because they came before Congress and voted. And I think what gets lost sometimes in my dad's message is that he did vote to go into Afghanistan, and he did vote to go after bin Laden. He's had some differences about exactly where people are tried and what the restraints should be. But I think really that isn't the vast majority of the difference that people have because I think almost everybody on the stage would say we shouldn't be letting the president go to war unilaterally without congressional authority. All right. Uh, we always appreciate you being on Rand Paul on the Sean Hannity Show, 800-945-5735. Uh,